I am a human being and I killed human beings. Before I knew it, I'd fired four shots at the door. I kept on shouting for Reva to phone the police. Tests are underway to determine if a serial killer is on the loose in Centurion Pretoria. The dead won't bother you. It's the living you gotta worry about. In South Africa, 57 people are murdered every single day. These are the stories of the killers and the people who hunt them. I think society deserves to be protected from me and from others like me. I would strangle them while having sex. I would go into another world when I'm strangling them and raping them. When I was strangling them, they would go limp, like a jellyfish. Made me feel like a king. I had sex with some of the dead bodies. Then I can have my ecstasy. Then I can do things the way I wanted to. There's no screaming and chaos. I would fantasize about the murder and masturbate at the body also. This is an excerpt from an interview in 2006 with the serial killer Stuart Butibur Vulcan. My name is Paul Vivian Llewellyn. I'm a journalist curious about Africa's killers, criminals, and the cops who catch them. And joining me to discuss crime on the continent, as always, is Gerard Labaskachny, the former cop and current head of LNS Threat Management, who led the investigative psychology section of the South African Police Service from 2001 until 2016. In his time there, he worked on over 300 serial murder and rape cases, and he is the profiler. Well, it's nice to be back uh, in 2021. Please visit our YouTube page and subscribe, youtube.com forward slash C forward slash Profiler Africa. Please do subscribe and encourage your friends to subscribe. Also, we really want to get our subscriptions on YouTube up and awesome. We're also available on iTunes, SoundCloud and Spotify. Simply search Profiler. Again, please share the link that you like to use with friends at the office, in the gym, in your murder cult wherever um, you prefer you can engage with us on our social media pages our twitter and instagram handle is at profiler africa please also join the group on facebook uh, questions suggestions um, we'd love to take them um, we're planning a whole bunch of new episodes but we'd love your input on topics you'd like to hear about or cases that you'd like that that you're interested in uh, you can also email us on profiler africa info at gmail.com um, crime scenes, evidence picks, images of the killers we cover and their victims. We do put some interesting content on our social pages, so check them out. Um, yeah, so we're back up and running, basically. So please do encourage your friends to uh, listen to the podcast, share, share, share. And uh, yeah, we're going to have a good year of great crime content. So today we are discussing the case of Stuart Butibur Vulcan. South Africa has had its fair share of serial murders. It's estimated that approximately 160 have been active, most identified since the early 1990s when the investigative psychology section of the South African Police Service was established. The first confirmed case where court records are available of a serial uh, of a serial murder spree was back in the 1950s, where Elifasi Msomi would lure unsuspecting women with offers of employment, then rape and murder them. And this is a common modus operandi, which, if you've listened to previous episodes, that is you know very much um, a common modus operandi up until today. A serial murderer returning to a crime scene while the body was present or removed to masturbate is not unheard of. Few, however, have included a cannibalism or necrophilia in their repertoire of behavior. One such offender that displayed both of these behaviors was Stuart Vulcan, also known as Butibur. And for our international listeners who may not know what Butibur means it literally means brother farmer this was a nickname that he picked up in his early years uh, vilken lived in the seaside town of port elizabeth and was a commercial fisherman by trade he was suspected of committing at least 12 murders having initially confessed to 12 but was ultimately convicted of seven when interviewed years later in 2006 um, he said that he had killed many more victims but had taken their bodies out to sea where he disposed of them so Stuart Vulcan, Gerard, let's talk a little bit about his background. Yeah. So I mean, obviously this case is just in general very interesting. It was sort of in the heyday of when serial murder kind of popped up on the radar in South Africa, which was the mid-90s. Um, and he was just quite a fascinating case uh, in general in terms of what he did, which I'm sure we'll get into in a moment. But, um, you know, one often asks, you know, what the background of these individuals, what creates a serial murderer? And, you know, as I often say, there's just, so much we don't know about why someone becomes a serial murderer. You've got, as we'll see now in a moment, Stuart Wilkin that had a horrific 
background. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have other guys like the Norwood serial murderer, which we discussed, Corpus Caldenace, who had a very plain, boring upbringing, both parents still married, etc. So background can't be a definitive cause for why someone becomes a serial murderer, because then we would have a lot more serial murderers running around society. Um, and, and what Wilkin did is he gave a lengthy statement about his background, his upbringing, etc., and what he went through as a child, which we're going to go through a lot of that now, which was confirmed, you know, by various people that, you know, a lot of these events did take place. So this isn't just sort of him trying to mitigate and get some sympathy from people. Um, so he was born in 1964 in Boxburg, which is obviously up here in the Gauteng province, although his murders took place in the Eastern Cape. Um, and so he was 26 when he committed his very first murder in 1990 that we can kind of confirm. Like you said, I mean, he, he claimed to have committed a lot more murders that there was never really any confirmation for. He says he committed his first mm -hmm. murder at 18. Again, we have no confirmation for sure that that is the case. Um, and he says that you know, at, at a young age, him and his sister were basically abandoned in a telephone booth by his biological parents. Um, then people sort of found him there and took him in and looked after him. But they, according to him, also abused him. They would burn him with cigarettes on his genitals. He had to eat his food with the family dogs, etc., and other physical assaults. Just sort of psychological abuse, putting down, being blamed for everything. Um, and that kind of stuff on such a young child, even an adult, you know, really just destroys your sense of self-worth and who you are and your identity. And I mean, one could imagine just growing up with a lot of hatred yeah. um, for the world in general. Because um, you just have no source of anybody who's there to help you and look after you. And like I said, you know, the first people that took him in, him and his sister abused him. And then the people that adopted him, according to him, also abused him. Um, and, and I mean, I think he only met his biological mother uh, when he was three. I think he had a sort of a brief visit. And I don't think he quite realized who this lady was. And then after he was convicted uh, in 1999, I think he had some brief contact with his biological mother. He never met his sister after they were separated after being abandoned in the telephone booth okay um oh really yeah yeah oh that's interesting um any idea where she is is she um, still alive is she you know in 2006 when i went to interview him uh i think she was still alive or well, I, I suppose you can't confirm because he hadn't yeah. had contact with her since 2002 Maybe we can facilitate to Stuart to meet his sister at some point. <laughs> oh, oh, with the sister, yeah. I mean, that's, uh, yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't even know if he knows what her name or adopted name oh, really? is. I mean, I think it's the point of, I think they got separated and okay, well, never really had any contact. So he had no contact with his biological mother much later. Okay. Uh, but not since 2000. Okay. And so juvenile delinquency at a young age, because he, he also, I mean, he was, he kind of came onto the radar of law enforcement at an early age as well, didn't he? Yeah. Uh, with things like he had early marijuana possession, things like that, petty crime. Yeah, so uh, about Malicious 20, yeah. injury to property he was convicted of in 1987. Um, so you saw kind of criminal behavior prior to the... Yep. To yeah, him I think kind of he, about jumping into murder. 2021, 20, I think, with the possession of marijuana. And then about three years later, malicious injury to property... Um, you know, so, you know, not major stuff. Yeah. Um, of course, we don't know what else he was doing that he wasn't sort of arrested for. Yeah. This is just obviously the conviction. conviction. Just to contextualize, have you met Stuart Vulcan? Yeah. So have you I, sat down with him? Yep. So I spent Tell us a little bit about that. Two days in 2006, in t myself and a colleague from my unit at the time, Colonel DeLunger, uh, went down to interview him. And we did that purely just because we, we wanted to try and start kind of like what, the, what you see in Mindhunter, etc., uh, which we had done from time to time, going down and interviewing these guys post-conviction, because obviously we would interview a lot of these suspects at the time of the, re the arrest, but the interview was very often for a different purpose. We're trying to get investigative information, obviously hopefully get a confession out of the individual. Mm. Um, where possible, one would try and explore a little bit more of the psychology of the individual, but they're, of course, in the context of, I've just been arrested, are they going to tell us everything? So we thought to go down after the conviction, after they've been sentenced, and maybe see if they will tell us different stuff. Uh, also, I was not involved in the investigation of Stuart Wilkin at the time, so I'm sort of a clean face. He can't harbor any anger towards me as maybe someone who played a role in putting him behind bars. Mm. Um, and it was quite fascinating. So we interviewed him for over a period of two days, like maybe two hours a day, etc. 
uh, and a lot of sort of the quotes that you see here are kind of coming from that particular interview. Okay. And he's quite a fascinating guy. He was in prison, uh, the private prison just outside of Bloemfontein, which is quite an impressive facility at the time I was there, much better than our sort of typical government prisons. And uh, he was quite candid in that interview um, about what he had experienced. Just what are your impressions of him as a as a man, as a guy? Uh, you know, when you first met him, is he is he physically a strong man? Has he got that? He's you know not, what? You know, He's not a very tall guy. He's, I would probably say he's about my height, and I'm not very tall. I'm 168. A podgy guy. A podgy guy okay. with a beard. Um, Afrikaans speaking, obviously. Um, in a way, not, again, not what you typically might think in your mind of a serial murderer. But then again, these guys typically are not what you think mm. uh, when, when you finally meet them. So Articulate. Uh, not particularly. I mean, I think if you, if, we, if you hear his background, as we said now, it, he's kind of on that very... As I said, Afrikaans, a plot will be order. Okay. You know, even in his, in his home language, which we would do in the interview in Afrikaans, you know, it's, he's not using fancy, highfalutin, you know, sort of Afrikaans language. It's kind of like you'd expect the fisherman sort of crowd from mm. a sort of poor white community. Mm. Um, but he was, you know, engaging. Um, his memory of, you know, of his crimes and of his, just his mm. life in general. Some of it was pretty good. Some of it he did struggle to remember. Um, you know, I asked him if that statement that he'd written all those years ago at the time of his arrest, which he presented in court, where he gave a lot of the history, I said, is that, do you still sort of stand by that statement and the contents thereof? And he said, you know, yes, he does. Um, a little bit unrealistic. He was hoping that, you know, he's, when he's released, he's going to go and stay with the woman he had married, who was still, still technically married too, mm-hmm. um, but hadn't really had much contact with her. And you know, his idea, he's going to go stay with her when, he's, when he gets released. And I'm thinking, ah, have you explored this with this lady? Because <laughs> I just wonder if she would really be that keen after all these years yeah. to have you backstage. Look, I'm sure he'll find someone because there's plenty. This serial killers don't seem to have any problem with finding a new woman and getting married in jail. Yeah. It seems to happen a lot in America. Yeah, and I mean, I've just seen so many times here where people have committed horrific crimes against women and find a new girlfriend who stands by them. It's, just, it's, it's, just, Weird, it's a whole research it? project and story and podcast on its own. I think we'll have to bank that for an episode, actually. Um, so we're talking... Okay, let's get back to kind of his timeline, his, yeah. his, his, his story. So trouble as a young man, trouble at school led to industrial school. Yeah. Take us from there. Yeah, so I mean, through his, through his school years, again, abused, teased by children. He ends up um, in, an, as you said, an industrial school, which is kind of like where in South Africa he used to send problem kids. Yeah, like a tech. Yeah, um, and he was there again, abused, running away from there. Um, he was, says he was, was sodomized by people that went there, blamed for everything. And he, he did eventually, I think he failed four times, but he eventually completed grade 11, which in South African terminology in the old days would be what we call standard nine which is one year short of, of finishing high school. Um, and he says that, that that treatment in that industrial school, which was a boarding school, just developed this hatred inside of him that made him want to take revenge against the world. Okay. Um, so that was quite cardinal. You know, after um, he finished high school, like many South Africans of that sort of day and age, they, he was conscripted into the into the military as, as, as white males were at the time. Mm. But I think three months into it, he had to try to commit suicide. And I think they realized <laughs> this, this guy's more problem than he's problem worth. Child, yeah. And he was discharged, medically discharged from the military service, which okay. I think probably would have been about two years at that time, maybe one year. Okay. And kind of went back to his adopted family, you know, trained as a fitter and a turner, married his first wife. <clears throat> Things kind of went well for a while. And then... Then he says she started to whore around, you know, yes. literally that was his own word. You know, I, I was in PE because I was tired of my adopted family. I met her and after a month I moved in with her. What attracted to me, what attracted me to her was that she treated me well for the first two years of the marriage. I worked away a lot and she began to whore and it disgusted me for money. She was unemployed. She had a state income because she was unmarried and had to care for the children. She was on welfare. I would catch her red handed with policemen. And this was taken from one of your interviews in mm. 2006. Yeah. So he did have a child with his first wife, a little girl with the name 1A. Um, and this actually, she became one of his, sort of close towards the end of his series, one of his victims. Um, he was, in total, he was married twice. And the second wife, um, technically, in 2006, when I went to go see him in prison, he was still technically married to her. And that's the one he was sort of had this idea or fantasy of going to live with when he's eventually discharged from prison one day. So we've got a young man who has had a very troubled upbringing in a working class, difficult environment. Um, 
had run-ins with the law, um, has developed a, a, an anger and a general kind of distaste for the world. Um, we'll get into his crimes after the break. Please subscribe to our page on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash C forward slash Profiler Africa. We're available on iTunes, SoundCloud and Spotify. Just search Profiler and you can follow us on Instagram or Twitter at Profiler Africa and join our Facebook group now. The conversation continues momentarily. We are discussing the murder series of the notorious uh, Port Elizabeth-based serial killer Stuart Buttibur Vulcan, who plied his trade in the uh, late 80s and early 90s. Uh, we're moving on to his crimes. Vulcan stated that his motive for the murders was because, as a child experiencing the abusive events that we discussed in the first segment of the show, he'd asked God for help, and God had helped him. Vulcan felt that he would take revenge on God one day by committing the mistakes that older people committed upon him. Vulcan stated, I wanted to be God. He stated that while murdering his victims, they had to shout out to God for help. He said that the control over the person is what gave him pleasure. I would fantasize about it. It would make me happy to see them submit. I would say, you see, God, I got you. So let's talk a little bit about now his crimes escalating from petty kind of incidents <clears throat> to now escalating to these more sadistic crimes that we start seeing emerging. Yeah, and I mean, I would love to get into his head and focus on, and, I, and I'm not quite sure if I did this, you know, how much detail I did this when I interviewed him, to say, but what else had he been up to? Because, you know, the crimes that he, we know he committed, the, the, the marijuana and um, malicious injury to property, you know, but what else was he doing to animals, to other kids, to people, to sexual partners, etc.? cetera, um, that, you know, him acting out bits and pieces of his frustration and anxiety um, and, and, and revenge themes, because they didn't pop up, you know, just before he committed his first murder. Mm. And that's sort of a, you know, to see the full escalation of, of what had happened leading up to what we know happened mm. um, would be quite fascinating. Like, as I said, he did comment, oh, you know, I started when I was 18, but then he gave this whole elaborate thing. Then I would kill them, steal a car, put the body in the car, go down to the sea, steal a boat, dump them out of the sea, come back, put the boat back. It's like, oh, come on, dude, no. Uh, I, don't, I don't think so. Yeah, sounds um, like a, <clears throat> been, he's borrowing from some movie plots. Yeah, exactly. You yeah. Know, um, so it really would be great to know what were the little incremental steps in that were not necessarily criminal, but was pushing that boundary of forcing people, exerting his anger over people, animals, etc., would be quite uh, would be quite fascinating. Yeah. But I mean, he Let, almost has this sort of typical of what you think a serial murder would have. In he his kind background. of ticks all the boxes, doesn't yeah. he? This is what I think people need to understand in this episode about Stuart Vulcan. He's kind of like the model serial killer because he portrays characteristics from all of the serial killers you can think of, really. Mm. Let's talk about the crimes then, and hopefully in that discussion we can see how he's evolving and how his fantasies, you know, these kind of new ideas of, uh, you know, what he can do to his victims are evolving as he's, as he's moving from crime to crime. So let's start at murder number one. How do we okay. get there? So obviously, like I said, there were, there were uh, quite a few murders that he was not necessarily found guilty for, but they believed were his work because of the location of the crime scenes, the victimology. <clears throat> now, again, you have to remember this is his, his sort of series started. The first conviction was a 1990 case, and his last conviction was, uh, and his last murder was in 1997. So he spanned seven years mm. of activity. Um, but this was also, as I said, 90 to 97. This was the early days of forensic mm. science, actually. You yeah. know, in South Africa, I think it was only... Around about 95, we started using DNA. And again, it's a, it was a very primitive version of DNA analysis compared to what we do now. You know, it's, it's, it's the ability now to pick up DNA from minute trace mm. samples is much better. And to specifically be able to say out of one in a billion, it's going to be you mm. compared to what we were dealing with back in the 90s. So we, do, we didn't have this. And this is kind of where you think back, wow, if we'd use that similar fact evidence, the linkage analysis that we've sometimes spoken about in other episodes, to have given that kind of evidence, would we have gotten convictions on some of the other ones mm. that he was found not guilty for? Or would we have even been able to charge him with more? Is there po possibly evidence sitting in a room somewhere in the Eastern Cape from other crimes that 
could today be reevaluated to kind of try and link him to those crimes? It is possible. You know, again, in the, in those days, um, like I said, we didn't maybe have technology, which, again, if you go back and pull all that evidence, might we have technology to gather evidence that we couldn't even think of before mm. um, that had been kept. And same thing when DNA started to be used overseas. You know, they had cases from 15 years prior to DNA. They think, hey, this DNA stuff, maybe we can look for that on our exhibits and yeah. they would be able to find. Um, so... It's, it's difficult to say, would anybody bother? I don't think so, uh, partly because it's now 30-ish years ago that, you know, that some of these things, where would the exhibits necessarily be? What condition would they have been kept in? And people would probably look at this and go, but this guy's convicted on seven counts of murder. Yeah. You know, he's not going to get out. What's the point of us channeling energy into that? Which I get, I get the logistical reasons for that and the practical reasons for that. Although for me as a profiler, I hate it when is a crime that we know this person's responsible or could be responsible mm-hmm. for, mm-hmm. then we don't kind of go ahead. No, you've got to think about those family members. But, you know, if there was any, that's where you'd assume the biggest push to yeah. um, reinvestigate older cases would come from. And if there's not that desire there, then who would bother? So what you're suggesting is that chances are that he had murdered some people pre-90. Yeah, um, again, we, we I always say it's very arrogant of us to think we know of every case that a person has committed. I mean, yeah. you don't know he could have done something, you know, 10 kilometers further out of town. Yeah. And how are we going to link it unless it was somebody picking up a modus operandi? Because in those days, like I said, you know, these outside crime scenes, so fingerprints are probably not even non-existent. In those days, I don't think they could even get fingerprints off of a body, which we, we can do now. Mm. DNA wasn't something that was present that would have helped us pick up a link. Um, and again, you have to remember, this is 1990 up to 1997. These victims, if I recall correctly, all but one or two were black or colored in terms of South African terminology. Yeah, and, and as we Did discussed the police in the past, really yeah. care? No, exactly. Even in those days, if you look at some of the original crime scene photographs, you know, your black victims were photographed in black and white and the colored white victims were photographed in colored because color photography was more expensive. <laughs> That's how the silly yeah. sort of apartheid system even came down into crime scene photographs. Mm. So would people have bothered that much? Mm. You know, is it that why it took I five years, it. six years and, and before, you know, police really jumped into this and, hey, we've got a serial and put the yeah. effort and solved it? Yeah. So let's look at his early crimes. Take us through yeah. to number one that he was convicted for. Yeah, and, and in fairness, perhaps coming back to what I was saying now about linkage, um, he had from young boys to adult females. So even then, would the police have thought this is two, this these are the work of the same person? Yeah. You know, those are the days where we didn't really even have the term serial murder when this he started yeah. out. So you weren't. They were, yeah, you weren't thinking at a, there wasn't a sophisticated level of consideration as to how these crimes potentially fitted together. And we would look at it completely differently now if we had bodies popping up, no matter what the ages, yeah. race, genders, etc. So yeah, so the very first one, and this is one that he was convicted for, was 1990, and was a 16-year-old young boy. And, and most of his, well, I think almost all of his little boy victims were street kids that he usually kind of propositioned or lured with the with this offer of some sexual favors. Um, so that was 1990, 16-year-old little boy. Then we kind of, the next one was in October of 1990, um, uh, adult female prostitute, uh, or sex worker, sorry, who was 25 years old. And what kind of, what are we seeing? What characteristics stand out for the, for the murders themselves? You know, what kinds of fantasies are at play here? A strangulation was typically how he killed all of his victims. And he actually said at one point, you know, I enjoyed this feeling like I, I would... I would strangle them and I would get my orgasm while they're sort of wrestling and having those sort of death throes, you know, as as the person literally dying and passing out from the strangulation, that would give him his orgasm. So in a way, kind of a very sort of sadistic type of way of achieving his orgasm. Mm. And of course, strangulation is an incredibly hands-on, it's the most hands-on kind of way of killing someone. And it's very intimate. You can feel the heartbeat. You can feel the struggle. Where's a knife? There's mm. still that metal between you and that person. Mm. Um, shooting someone is even more impersonal. I read somewhere that he liked to see the the eyes of his yeah. victims kind of popping out of their heads. Yeah, I think he called um, it the jellyfish as, effect, if I okay. recall yeah. correctly. And so that that is what really gave him his orgasm. Okay. So even with some of the sex workers, he would engage with voluntary, consensual, contractual sexual behavior vaginally. And then he would say, then he would go over into anal, which he Typically, they, they weren't going to give him permission to do. Mm. And he liked the fact that I'm forcing them. It's anal, and that's now the did, killing. Did you ask him how he interprets his sexuality? 
I don't know, you know what his sexual, yeah. his sexual preference. Um, I would be hesitant. Look, uh, you, know, you can argue it one way. If you've had sex with a boy, are you then automatically bisexual if you're also having sex with females or not? And I don't think it's that simplistic. Mm. And I think specifically with his context of him and his motives, which were revenge and making God pay, mm. um, I wouldn't go so necessarily to say that he was bisexual or homosexual. Yeah. Uh, Did the sex of the victim matter, really? I mean, ultimately, it's about playing out that murder fantasy of control and power and all of those things mm, the so whether vic- it's a yeah. whether it's a male or a female would it they serve different effect? purposes so okay. the the adult female victims you said reminded him of that first wife who okay. he says was a was a whore in, in his own terminology yes, a yes. sex worker and that's why he would then that's what he would get his revenge against his ex-wife with those victims okay. uh, and the children it, it was almost about punishing god saying see god i'm going to do what you allowed to happen to me and these little kids have to scream out saying, help me, God. Yeah. So they kind of serve different purposes. Okay. And that's why I also say, uh, we must be careful to say this is about sexual attraction to, to boys. For sure. Um, just because of that. And again, I mean, does it, does it really, you know, sort of, sort of matter? Yeah, it almost feels like the sex part is, it's a pleasurable aspect for him. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's not what's motivating him. Yeah. It's nice that he gets the sexual release as a consequence of the murder but ultimately he's playing out this kind of anger it's anger revenge yeah and that's very common with your serials it's about power control revenge revenge against a class of people yeah uh, not necessarily a particular person that's why they typically talk to strangers in most instances so it is about yeah and and, and it's well documented that rape is about power and control yeah yeah why 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 would he not feel a sense of empathy towards children because he feel you know because he's because they're children and because that's when he was a victim and so why wouldn't he associate being protective of children Mm. um you know why would his response go in completely the other direction where he now wants to play out revenge on Mm. a child almost like exactly what happened to him it's like you know he's becoming the his own abuser well, I think because we're normal, psychologically healthy people, we, we think that. Um, but it's, you know, it's quite well documented that of people who are offending against children, mm. a lot of them themselves had a history of being offended against. Now, again, there's a bit of a misconception. People think that means if you were abused as a child, you're going to become an abuser. And that's definitely outdated thinking. I just want to say that very clearly, clearly for our listeners. You know, there's so many people that are abused sexually in our society, and, and most of them become normal, upstanding, kind, em- empathic citizens. Mm. But often in those who do offend, if you look backwards in their history, you do find this background. So again, why don't they develop that? You know, maybe the ones that do have normal, healthy, psychological minds don't go on to hurt anybody. But it's this this minority of them that do not think and believe the same way. Yeah. Whether he never had empathy to start with, whether it was just literally extinguished from his psyche by his background and history, hmm. difficult to say. Yeah. Okay. Um what else stands out from these 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 early murders? Um, yeah, so I mean, we have you know, look, it's kind of one or two a year um, consistently throughout the years. I'm just trying to look at my timetable. Yeah, I don't think I think it's maybe one year where we don't have a confirmed murder, and again, that doesn't mean murders weren't taking place. Yeah, absolutely. But it starts off with a boy, then it goes to a 25 year old sex worker, 37 year old sex worker, then down to a boy again, and another boy, and then a 42 year old sex worker. Um, then down to a 10-year-old, which was his daughter, uh, which was towards the sort of, uh, about, I think, the fourth or fifth victim, and then a 22-year-old sex worker, and then down to a little boy, which was his um, ex-girlfriend's son, okay. which was his last victim, who was 12 years old. Um, and it's just this up and down between to victimology, etc. cetera. Um, and again, the strangulation, as we said, we, was his preferred means. But there was one right in the middle, where he did something that he did not do with any of the victims. Um, and this is where he becomes even more fascinating as, as, a, as, as a psychologist looking at these cases, is he kind of went to this one episode of experimentation with one of his victims. And this was a, a 42-year-old uh, sex worker, um, the oldest of his victims, if that makes any difference to why he did this to her specifically. And after, you know, the typical luring her away, having sex with her, raping her, killing her, after she was dead, he then cut off the nipples and external parts of the, of the, the vagina. Uh, he ate those at the scene. He stuck his hand into the vagina to sort of feel around inside the, the body. 
he kind of took a knife and he stabbed it into her stomach. Just, and he said he just wanted to see what it felt like to mm. have a knife going into someone's skin. So it was almost that particular case was this experimentation. He never did it again after that, any of those elements. He didn't do it before that in any combination. And he just almost had this experimentation. Um, okay. I'm curious. I want to see what this is about, what it's like, what it tastes like, etc. When you're interviewing him about the different murders, what is his demeanor like when he's speaking about the different crimes? Does it, does it vary as he's discussing different murders, whether it's the children or the adults? You know, if I think back to, to, the, to the two days of interviews, he could have been, in all the stuff, all these horrible things that happened to him, the, each, the different murders that he was convicted for to the children and the adults, we could be talking about model trains. He doesn't, change, he doesn't get teary-eyed. He doesn't get sad. He doesn't get angry. It's just like there's nothing there. Mm. Um, and that's perhaps what's really kind of almost concerning. Yeah. Um, you know, even when, he, when I asked him about the nipples that he cut off and ate and the vagina that he cut off and ate, the external parts, um, he kind of had a bit of a chuckle at that. Um, okay. But for the most part, like I said, it's really as if you're talking about the most mundane thing mm. on the planet um, when he's discussing these things. Do you get a sense of pride then? I mean, you talk about the chuckle when he's talking about cannibalism. <laughs> um, mm. did, did you get that sense that it, of pride, that, you know, that arrogance that comes from that serial killers have where they really want to, where they're proud of what they've done and they want to discuss it and they want to... Mm. Um, surprise you with their kind of um you know with their craziness you know i've had some of that before with different serial murderers i didn't feel that this was he was trying to shock he was trying to boast it was just okay. you know it happened um in a way now that i say it it, it, it kind of reminds me in, uh, to some degree how corbett corbett's held next the norwood serial murderer also spoke about his crimes it's kind of matter of fact yeah. And he also one or two times had a chuckle when he was sort of describing something that he thought kind of was humorous during one of his crimes. Yeah. Um, does that mean he's, the, he's a psychopath? Uh, I think that's a definitely a consideration yeah. for both of those individuals. Yeah. I mean, Kubis, I think, was diagnosed as a psychopath, um, that he doesn't have this emotional connect with what he's talking about. Yeah. Um, and, of course, that would then make me very concerned if he's back in society. How would you relate to people, women, children? It would be very worrying for me. Yeah, um, I guess it's a case of if if your if what gives you something like sexual gratification is strangling another human being for you that feels very normal. That's how your body, you know, how your your emotional self works. Mm. Um, you want to feel a certain emotion. You want to feel pleasure. It requires someone, you know, requires. Str you wouldn't understand why somebody that doesn't feel like that doesn't feel like that mm. yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah again which you, it's to try and transplant Just your mind into these people is, is is really yeah it's not easy and perhaps it's a good thing that it's not easy yeah i like that analogy i mean we've discussed this in earlier episodes where you talk about looking at a when you when you when you meet these people and you're trying to kind of place them you're kind of trying to put them in context uh, against kind of how you understand human beings to be and how do, how you understand people to be that it's it's hard to relate to them because it's like relating to a different species mm, yeah absolutely and trying to understand i would say trying to figure it out i've almost given up i just listen to how they frame it i mean again this is this is still their own self-understanding um is this are all these things really why he of all people became a serial murderer mm -hmm. are there not other people who've had again similar type of backgrounds even worse backgrounds that didn't mm -hmm. so again this is only his understanding and of course anybody who does these things is, is trying to understand trying to make sense of it for themselves yeah. so they put together this puzzle that they think is the reason why doesn't mean it is the reason why yeah do you, have you ever had the sense when you're interviewing somebody who's committed serial murder crimes or you know any kind of serial kind of kind of violent serial crime that um they they want to pick your brain as a mm. psychologist that they are yearning for somebody to help them understand what's going on in their in their heads yeah absolutely um you know for very often it's the first time that they are speaking to someone about these things i mean you can't tell you sit in the pub and say 
geez, Paul, um, I really need to talk to you. You know, <laughs> exactly. I, I have this interest in, and <laughs> exactly. I've gone out and killed a whole bunch of people. Exactly. So who do they go? They can't go to the, their priest pastor to do a mini. Mm. They can't go to their psychologist to talk about these things. They can't go to their best buddy to talk about these things. So mm. the first time they're arrested is often their first time to do so. And that's why I often say it's crucial to have appropriately trained people investigating these cases and appropriately trained people doing the interview of these individuals. Yeah. Because, and this is what happened in this case, Derek Norsworthy, who was the sort of lead investigator from the murder and robbery unit at the time, who had been trained in serial murder investigation and was able to interpret the crime scenes properly. And would, for, for, for example, said to him, so Stuart, how many times did you go back to these victims after you'd killed them and have mm. sex with their bodies? And, and for him, it was, for Stuart, it was like a mind blow. My God, this guy can read my mind. How did he know? Mm -hmm. And did you cover them for what reason? Um, you know what, and and that kind of made him realize: here's someone who's treating me a decently. Yeah, he's not sh screaming at me, hitting me in the old days in the policing. You know, putting a rubber tire over my head and choking me to death, or to get <laughs> yeah. me to confess. Yeah. Someone treating me dearly, and somebody who actually kind of has insight into the things I did. Yeah, and for him it was almost like this guy's reading my mind, and that then caused him to tell more and more and more, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's essential uh, when you do these investigations that you have to have people who are trained. Um, I mean, if you've gone into that interview with Stuart and been aggressive and, you know, cocky and arrogant, which a lot of people, policemen think that's how you interview suspects, yeah. um, belittling them, etc. These guys will yeah. shut up. Yeah. If you do it properly, you'll probably get a confession and or a pointing out, which is kind of what happened in this yeah, case. Yeah. Because these guys typically do like talking about what they want to do. Mm -hmm. So you've just got to press the simple buttons to help to help them do that after the break we're gonna we're gonna take a little break now afterwards i want to kind of talk about in more detail about necrophilia cannibalism those kind of components of his crimes um please subscribe to our page on youtube at youtube.com forward slash c forward slash profiler africa we're available on itunes soundcloud and spotify simply search profiler and you can follow us on instagram or twitter at profiler africa and join our facebook group now Okay, so we are back with uh, the final part of the show. We're talking about a, a very interesting early serial case in South Africa, the story of uh, Stuart Butibur Vulcan. Necrophilia, cannibalism, I mean, these are some of the most sadistic um, uh, acts that a serial killer can take part in. Let's talk a little bit about necrophilia. What is necrophilia? Hmm. And what are some of the motivations behind it? What are your, some of your thoughts when it comes to necrophilia? Well, personally, I don't like it. Personally. Sure. Not something <laughs> no. that you do on a Saturday morning. Um, yeah, it's, it's obviously the, the necrophilia fits in with what, from psychological terminology, we call a paraphilia, which is your sort of typically your more unusual uh, sexual interests. Okay. Um, so it is a diagnosis if it's something that brings you into conflict with the law, causes problems for you in your life, or causes you distress. So we don't want to obviously diagnose normal sexual interests. So if you enjoy being tied up and spanked, great. That's not a, that's not a, no reason for a diagnosis. But if you do that and it causes you anxiety, you feel guilt afterwards. You don't want it. You don't want to be doing that kind of thing. Then we sort of start to look at it as perhaps a disorder that needs to be worked on. So we differentiate between a paraphilia and a paraphilic disorder. Necrophilia tends to usually be sort of on the disorder side of things, mm -hmm. but it, it basically is a sexual arousal or attraction to dead people. Now, that doesn't always mean that you're going to go out and have sex with a dead person, but your fantasies might be centered around that. Mm -hmm. You might, for example, I've heard cases where the person would say, I would get my partner, my living partner, to get into an ice cold bath for a couple of minutes, get out and not have sex with her, because that would be mimicking, but in his mind, a cold dead body. Okay. But the pornography that they would have be attracted to would be porn simulated or otherwise of, of dead bodies. Um, so there has to, and so, so people can satisfy their necrophilic interests um, in non-criminal ways, but obviously it makes me always nervous if you have that interest, because what, you know, where, where, where would you go? down the line to satisfy these sort of necrophilic urges. And of course, the worst case scenario is killing someone for the mm. purposes of having sex with them after they're dead, or going to a mortuary where there are dead bodies and engaging with those victims or a, a funeral parlor, etc. Um, so essentially, it's, it's around the sexual attraction towards dead people and uh, yeah. So now, one of the aspects of, of Stuart Vulcan's crimes, 
um, that I understand is that that they found that he would stuff the anuses of his victims with newspaper mm. um, so that he, when he'd return to the body, he could continue to have sex with them in the anus. Um, and the, 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 the reason he'd stuff the orifice is so that it wouldn't um, get filled up with maggots. It wouldn't yeah. decompose as quickly. So, yeah, he realized, obviously, after a couple of bodies that, you know, they decompose. Yes. Um, and that's not great. That's also why he said um, he used condoms with the dead victims because, you know, I think he did realize okay. it can be a bit gross put in your appendage in a body uh, yeah. that's been decomposing. So yeah, so the the, the, paper, the tissue paper or newspaper would be to block the anus to prevent maggots because maggots tend to go for openings in the body of which, you know, the anus is a very attractive uh, yeah. part of the body for a maggot or a fly, for sorry, sure. to, to lay its eggs. Yeah. Um, how then, so so necrophilia, then cannibalism. Yeah. You say, in one, and this was, was this just one of the cases where he ate the nipples and some of the so basically ate parts of the genitals yep. of okay. his victim and it was the only victim that we know where both of those or one of those or both of those happened that we know of, of out of all the victims that we can definitely say were the work of Stuart Wilkin and again I think it was that exploration as to what and he's curious what does this taste like and I don't think I'll tell the readers the, yeah. the listeners what he said was the answer when I asked him what did it taste like yeah. he suffice to say that he said I just wish I had cooked it first okay Okay. Um, would you consider Stuart Vulcan to be a cannibal? Um, well, yes. I mean, cannibalism, it's not a, di it's not a diagnosis, uh, cannibalism itself. Um, mm. He did eat human flesh, so I think so, you, you okay, have to say fine. yes. I mean, the question is how many times do you have to do it? I think once is enough to be <laughs> okay. regarded as a cannibal. I'm sure there's some paraphilic disorder which uh, that you could diagnose him with, but again, paraphilia, is, there has to be some sexual link to the cannibalism before it would be regarded as a paraphilia because paraphilia is by nature are sexually surrounding sexual behavior. Um, so, so yes, you know, I would definitely say he is a cannibal. And as I said, I, I'm trying to think out of any of my other series, did I have the, the, the serial murderer eating part of the victims? I can't say I have. I've had it in other once-off cases where the person did eat body parts. And often there was a mental health concern in those particular cases okay. where they tended to be a once-off kind of case. Okay. Uh, but I mean, ultimately, the cannibalism here for Stuart Vulcan isn't really a part of his. Would you consider it's not really a part of his fantasy? It was a curiosity, mm. a once-off curiosity, but it didn't play into that kind of bigger, the bigger psychology of Stuart Vulcan that really motivated him to. Yeah, it know, was generally it, with his crimes. It's it stood out from I think what is general driving force for committing his crimes. Uh, otherwise, we would have seen that, that behavior more often. If it was part of his, or even off from that point onwards, if he felt, yeah, this is even a further way to denigrate my victims or whatever, then it would have continued to be part and parcel in some degree. Sure. And let's let's move back to um, Stuart Vilkin's series of crimes. Was there any sense of a different? Did he feel any differently to the folks that to the to the victims that he knew well? His daughter, um, his 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 girlfriend's son, the last victim. Did, what, did you get any sense that there was any different kind of, you know, kind of emotional connection to, to the different victims? Yeah, I think the sex workers, again, it was about, I hate you, your, your type of person, your class of person, because of my, my mother abandoned me and my first wife, you know, in his words, was, was a sex worker. Mm. Um, with the children, I think in his little twisted way, um, he did feel some kind of, Something I don't even know what to call it. I would be hesitant to call it empathy, you know, because he said he would cover their cover them with branches so that their souls could go to heaven. Um, with his daughter, who he murdered, you know, the story around that is that he she one day came to visit him. He was convinced that she had been sexually molested by someone. He actually told her to get undressed so he can inspect, which I think obviously is just, just creepy in its own right. Mm -hmm. And he says, nope, he could see from the vagina that she had been molested and he didn't want her to go through all the suffering and pain that he went through. Therefore, he decided he has to kill her. So in his own little twisted world, it was almost like what you call an what you call altruistic um, murder okay. to prevent her having to go through the pain and suffering. Oh, that he, and again, that's what he says. Yeah. Um, take it with a pinch of salt. But ultimately, he saw an opportunity to play out his fantasies, really. Yeah. And then he said, you know, with other, again, with the children, he would visit, visit their graves. He spoke to his daughter, asked her for forgiveness, uh, spoke to Henry, which was the, the, one of his ex-girlfriend's sons that he murdered, asked for forgiveness. 
Um, but he would still sometimes have sex with the dead bodies of the children when he went to visit them. So, <laughs> again, we, we're trying to fit this into our own understanding of what's yeah. logical and normal. Yeah. Don't, because yeah. uh, you're not going to. You know, we're not serial murderers. Yeah. I mean, do you get a sense that from a, like premeditation, how much premeditation is involved in what Stuart Vulcan was oh, doing? Yeah. You know, how much planning was he doing? How much, you know, was he considering the law enforcement environment of the time? And, um, you know, was he trying to um, evade detection um, by the police? I don't think he really tried to evade because, again, also forensic technology back then was not great yeah. compared to what it is now. Um, and obviously, he got away with it for seven years at least, from first confirmed murder to last confirmed murder. You know, in between, he would sort of, as I said, go back to the bodies. He also kept some of the clothing belonging to some of his victims, the G-strings, and he would masturbate around with those, and then he would sort of get rid of them after a while. So in between, he was still thinking about these things, satisfied himself, these fantasies in other ways, but it's not the same as actually killing someone. Mm. Um, he did watch the police at the crime scenes to see what they were doing so that he could do things better, he said. Oh, okay. yeah, in his own words, I'd watch them so I would know better next time how to do things better. Okay. Some are good, some are bad, but they weren't good at catching me, I think was literally okay. the words he used. <laughs> okay. But yes, the pre-planning, he, he lived in the area of most of his crimes, in the general area. Um, and he said, I would go out, I would look for scenes, um, I would know that I had a good place to go, um, when I was going to go out and commit my crime. And he said, but beforehand, search out a potential crime scene. It had to be quiet, allow him time to commit his crimes. And he says, and this is a quote, when I looked for a place, I knew what I was going to go and do there. Um, so yes, I mean, this is without a doubt, this was not, you know, spur of the moment, let me go and grab someone. He knew what he was going to go out okay. to do. He sourced out the crime scenes, which again is why we have that issue of comfort zones, which we've spoken about quite often, which is the area of operation that he feels safe, comfortable enough mm. to operate in. How did you, how did he feel about himself? Do you ever ask these guys, like, you know, what do you think of yourself? Sure, good question. I don't know if I actually put it so directly to him or even indirectly to him. Mm. Um, what is your sense of what he thought of himself? I think if one looks how he spoke about the crimes, like we discussed a moment ago, mm. um, about when he was talking about it, did it some kind of remorse or empathy or anything come through? And there was none of that. So I think he just, I don't think he feels particularly bad about himself. I didn't get that impression that yeah. regret, remorse, like, yeah, oh, man, I don't know how I could have done that. What was my mind like in those mm. days that, you know, it's almost like it's a different person. None of that. So I, yeah. I think he feels pretty much okay with himself. Okay. How did they catch this guy? How did Stuart get caught eventually? His daughter had been murdered a little bit before, um, and then the neighbor's son. And if I recall correctly, he was the last person seen with the neighbor's son, Henry Buckers. Um, and they just, I thought, hang on a minute, this is getting too, you know, this, this guy's name is too close to now two young kid victims. And then he was brought in for questioning, and that's, as I said, when Derek Norsworthy at the time um, interviewed him. And, and the manner of interviewing him was really what him, made him decide to, to actually confess okay. to what he was done. And he says he knew if he walked out that room, he was going to go do this again. So he felt, I want to go and tell them what I've done. So empathy to the degree that he had that desire to be caught to, to an extent. Yeah, I suppose you could put it that way. Yeah, that, listen, let me tell them what I've done. Or again, you could argue, was it bragging? I don't know if it was bragging. Um, perhaps on some level, him knowing I need to stop. I'd, yeah, yeah. Is, that, is that empathy or is that just, I don't know. Is it worth overthinking those kinds of aspects, I guess? Um, yeah, I wouldn't. He, he just did what he did. Yeah, and that's why I often say, you know, I gave up long ago trying to figure out why yeah. do people do this and focus on how do I use all this information to help catch people quicker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, I mean, it's it's certainly interesting the kind of level of premeditation and planning that okay. went into his crimes. But I guess like any other human being, you are the victim of your desires. And if your desires go into a very dark place, then, you know, are you thinking that much about why you're mm. doing something, what motivates you, what the psychology is that's gotten you to this point you really are just mm. acting out life as you see fit yeah i mean i see you now i'm just sort of looking at my notes i've got a quote that he that he gave me when i was interviewing him in 2006 and he says i knew that if i left 
that office, this is now when he's called in for the in relation to that last boy victim, Henry Buckers. He says, I knew that if I left that office, I would go out and murder. I wanted to stop. So I decided to point out two bodies. I really hurt them. I made them scream. I told them to scream to God and to come and help them. While I was having sex, I would strangle them with a cord in my hands and, and, and once a knife after I, after I tied. So wanted to stop, but why? Is it because he felt guilty? Is it because... I don't know. We, you know, you and I would assume, oh, he wanted to stop because he felt guilty. But I think we've got to be very careful to assume what was his reason why he wanted to stop. Hmm. Maybe he was just up for um, getting out of 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 society and getting a, a free bed and meal. Yeah. Getting yeah. away from the toughness that had been his life, or the you know the difficult dark life that he'd led. Yeah. Um, where's Stuart Vulcan now? So I saw him in 2006. He was in, the, as I said, the private prison in Bloemfontein. I think he was hoping to be transferred down to, I think it's St. Albans Prison, which is in near PE. Okay. I think probably in the, in the run-up to him getting parole one day, possibly, and that he'd be closer to this wife that he was technically still married to, that he had this sort of idea that he's going to go and stay with. But I'm not sure, actually, if he's been discharged um, and given parole. I hope not, but... I'm always cautious to say with South African Correctional Services what, when and where they might release someone. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, I'd, I'm, I, you'd like to think that Stuart Vulcan is the kind of guy that's now, that's going to spend the rest of his life in prison. Um, where do you place Stuart Vulcan as a serial killer? I mean, to me, um, I mean, I've got quite, from my kind of early interest in serial killer, I was, I was in Grahamstown in the mid-90s at university there, and I knew of Stuart Vulcan because I had friends that um, mm. worked in the psychology department there that would actually had actually gone down and met with him and interviewed him as part of a research study um, in, uh, that the, the university was conducting in their psychology department there. Um, so I've always, uh, for me, he's always been kind of the archetypal kind of, a bit of everything serial killer mm. in a South African context. Would you kind of put him there? Yeah, look, I'm glad we don't, or we haven't had somebody similar since then. Mm. Um, well, we've had serial murderers that have killed adults and children, the Mori Mori serial murder, which we, we might do a story on once, same thing. They had Janisburg Mind Dump serial murder, which we did do a story about adults and children. Um, I just think because the children involved, we really just don't want those guys running around. It's bad enough with adult victims only. Yeah. So he's, but he is kind of a classic um, in that sense. And like I said, I hope we don't have another one, but he is one that is talked about yeah. um, a lot. Perhaps unfairly so, because if we don't have a lot of them doing this kind of thing, what value do we attach to talking about him? And you yeah. can also argue, are we not glorifying these guys? Um, the more we talk about them, but that's a total, you know, totally separate argument on its own. Um, look, there's an, people like true crime podcasts. That's why we're here, Gerard, because um, there's a, there's a segment of our society with a large female skew. That <laughs> that's true, <laughs> which is true, just from our data that comes back on on our listenership, um, who are interested in serial crime. So um, mm. I guess the the morbid side of our nature is something which um, is a curiosity for people generally. It's been about a year since we recorded our last episodes. Um, let's talk about where we stand right now, beginning of 2021. Um, obviously, I know that you're not. You know, we all know that you're not. Um, within the kind of organization of SAPS anymore. But where do we stand? Where does the, 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 the psychology unit stand at SAPS? Mm. What, what is your kind of knowledge of our current serial crime fighting capability in South Africa? Mm. Um, look, they went through a point about two or three years ago where there were no psychologists. Remember, the unit always had, the investigative psychology section always had police detectives and psychologists Sometimes one, sometimes two, sometimes I think the most we ever had was four at any given time, and then it dropped back down to none after I, a year after I'd left. So over the past couple of years, they have appointed, I think they've got about four or five psychologists. I think the most recent appointments were in 2020. So in the different provinces, and I think one based at head office where I used to sit. Um, so the detective component has been pretty good and it's grown actually and a lot of the stalwarts who are still there thank goodness and it's grown so actually the unit is the biggest it's ever been now i think it was the other day when i wrote 
um, something for somebody's textbook. I think I said we had 44 people, of which almost all of those were detective background people. And again, as I said, thank goodness, some of the stalwarts like uh, Lieutenant Colonel Elmarie Mayberg, who was finally promoted after like 18 years, and Lieutenant Colonel Jan de Lange, who I often speak about, both of those people are still there, thank goodness, um, as a few of the other individuals. Um, the psychology component I'm always a bit nervous about because since they've appointed all these people, they haven't used any of the ex-psychologists, whether that's me, uh, Bronwyn Stollars, who left not long after me, or Marina Chanis, who left and was there for a couple of years, or Latabo Boy, who was there for a couple of years. None of us have ever been approached to help train the new ones. So my fear is, what are they doing? Because you know you don't learn to do this kind of work at university, mm. you know. And even if you studied a whole bunch of textbooks, you're not trained. That doesn't mean you're trained to do what we need you to do. Mm. And then what are you going to end up doing? Finding things that you can do, which are not necessarily within the mandate of what you are supposed to be doing as an investigative psychologist. Okay. And that's my biggest concern that we haven't really given the kind of training that the, that the psychologists in the investigative psychology section need. And not just training, because training is one thing. Mentoring is perhaps the gel that makes it all work. Would they ask me? Probably not. I don't think they like me very much. And my book's coming out soon in, in March. And I think they're going to like me. The police management's going to like me even less because it's a very open and honest account of some cases in my time in SAPS. So I doubt they'd ever use me, to be honest with you. Um, but hopefully they would turn to other people like Bronwyn and some of the other psychologists to help. I mean, you can, you can say you can get people from overseas to come out. Yes, there's some great people that I could recommend who have a psychology or psychiatry background. But you do have to have people of local knowledge and experience because, you know, if you're going to be testifying in court, if you're dealing with local cases, you really do have to have someone who's worked on those cases before. Yeah. So in short, it's bigger than it ever was, mainly with detectives, which is great because a lot of the work we do is just helping the investigation get right. I am still nervous about the psychologists. There are more, um, but who's mentoring them? They're often on their own in Cape Town, on their own in Limpopo. Who's there to guide them? That's my biggest concern. Yeah. Well, look, maybe we should make it our goal to get, um, maybe to have a conversation with these guys, potentially. Let's see. You never know, Joe. Well, hopefully they listen to the podcast because exactly. that will be a good place exactly. they can perhaps We'd get We'd like some, to invite uh, you guys <laughs> who are currently working there at SAPS Detective Myber, is it Myber? Elmery Myber. Sorry, yeah. Elmery Myberg and Jan de Lange. And Jan de Lange. We would love to invite you guys to come onto the podcast. Hopefully, we can. Let's let's try, man. Why why not? And I think the other thing we need to do is get you and a microphone into correctional services at some point. Like a, somebody like Stuart Vulcan, I think would be wonderful to have you sit down with an hour, for, you know, for an hour, um, for the podcast. You never know. Let's just put it out there. You know the secret. Um, okay, so that's Stuart Vulcan. What an interesting guy. One of those one of those guys that really piqued my interest in serial crime from a from a younger age when I was floating around the Eastern Cape. Um, Jared, you've got a book coming out. Mm. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, you know, when I left SAPS, even before I left, people were always saying, when are you writing your book, etc." cetera. And, and uh, when I was in SAPS, I just didn't have time. When are you was... writing your first book? Let's put it at the yeah. start there. Um, you know, I'd always wanted to do this. Um, and even before I left SAPS, people were saying, when's your book coming out? You know, Mickey wrote a book, when you're writing a book. And in SAPS, I just didn't have the time, literally. I was working, I was getting three hours sleep at night in, when I was in SAPS. Mm. And when I left SAPS, I was just so burnt out, I just thought, I can't even face writing a book now. But it always been nagging at the back of my head. And I'd had a few journalists who had said, listen, let me co-write it with you, which, you know, is something that happens quite a lot. And even Jacques Poe, who wrote, you know, The President's Keeper, which was a massively huge bestseller in South Africa, said, listen, let me, let's write it together. Mm. But I kind of felt, you know, it's a really personal journey. And I wouldn't want someone else writing, interpreting what I'm saying and writing in their own words. And I felt I got to write this. <laughs> Whether it's a success or not, <laughs> it will be a different <laughs> question. And eventually with, you know, lockdown and COVID last year, 2020, and you know, I kind of suddenly had the time. Mm -hmm. But I think it also coincided with me psychologically feeling like oh, I could do this now. Yeah. And also hoping, hey, maybe they'll give me an advance, which they don't do. <laughs> the first of all, okay. um, but I kind of just it was something on my bucket list of wanting to do one day, not an academic book, but a book for people to read an and, account yeah i wouldn't say enjoy but to find fascinating yeah and i approached sort of to author i'd written one chapter up and i sent it off to um publishers um both came back and said yes and i had to look at obviously which the deals that both offered and what you know that what you have to obviously choose a deal that's the best for you and and penguin was the one that turned out to be the best offer and, and obviously awesome. a very well respectable publishing house and they said great how soon can you have it done and i said look 
October, and I did actually manage to get it done. And essentially what it is, it's, it's seven chapters. The first one is a little bit about me um, and how I ended up when I left school, going to the army, and how did I end up in psychology with mm -hmm. such terrible metric marks, um, and getting to, you know, and eventually going from studying psychology and qualifying into the police, which was never what I thought I'd end up doing, and my kind of what I thought about the time in the police. That's sort of chapter one. Then I kind of chapter two, I go into serial murder in South Africa. Um, when did it start? The start of the unit, where it went to over the years when I was in charge. And the remaining five chapters are, are basically a case per chapter. Some two or three of them we've discussed here mm -hmm. um, in the podcast. But of course, the book you go into a lot more detail than we go into in the part. And the podcast is a different thing. We're, we're sort of it's a discussion, and we go where the discussion goes. Yeah. Whereas the book you kind of tell step for step each and every case okay. with my thoughts worked into it. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and it, it's coming out in the beginning of March 2021. Um, and hopefully there's going to be, tw I think, two and a half thousand print for the first run. And hopefully there'll be a second and a third and a fourth run. And if it, the book does well enough, I will really consider doing book number two. And the movie? And the movie. <laughs> and the, yes, all those hope. Yeah, we'll see if Brad Pitt's available, you know. You know, you send out the book brief to two to two publishers, and and they both come back with yes. Why are we not getting more yeses on our TV series opportunities, Who Gerard? Knows? Because I tell you, as a TV producer myself, that's the one thing I think we need to push as well. Is yeah. you know, there are a lot of um, cases that the world is unaware of that a lot that we've discussed on the mm. podcast already, um, that would just make great content for netflix and there are so many more i mean so I, netflix hit us up <laughs> i mean as i said i selected just five cases for the book i have hundreds of equally if some of them if not more fascinating cases serial single murders you name it um that i could write a whole bunch of books and obviously we can have a whole bunch of podcast episodes and tv episodes etc there's no shortage of absolutely fascinating cases well that sounds like something we can kind of unpack this year then um, a lot more stories, a lot more episodes of the podcast. And, um, yeah, I think we need to explore the opportunities that come along with those. The book, we're definitely going to have to give away a book, there give away yeah. a signed book. True. So um, stay tuned in the coming weeks for details of how you can get your hands on um, a book personally autographed by Gerard, his own book, his first there book. What's the, the book called? Yeah, the, the Profiler Diaries. That was my kind of choice Ooh, of a nice. title. And then the, the, the publishers wanted to add sort of a, what do you call it, a secondary tag on title um, from the case files of a police psychologist. Ah. Yeah. So I the suppose then book two diary. could be Profiler Love Diaries, it. chapter two, or the next, fa I don't know. The I see sort of a whole series. It's in the, the next Twilight. That's what's happening here. The next Harry Potter. <laughs> Thank you, Gerard. Um, we'll be back again soon with the next episode. So um, please do subscribe to our page on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash C forward slash Profiler Africa. We're available on iTunes, SoundCloud and Spotify. Simply search Profiler and you can follow us on Instagram or Twitter at Profiler Africa and join our Facebook group now. We'll see you again soon. Um, more details of Gerard's book coming up in the weeks to come. Like I say, you may even be able to get your hands on one. We'll do a nice, we'll do a competition on the show. Like a, we'll think of a, mm. a serial killer question that people have to answer. Thank you very much, Gerard. Thanks, Paul. And uh, we'll be back again soon. Pleasant dreams. <laughs>